far, well, when we get into the book of Daniel, we're going to notice that Daniel is about conflict. And that's why the title of this lesson is uh, the, the Controversy Begins or The Conflict Begins. Because the first thing we're going to read in Daniel is the fact that Nebuchadnezzar, who was the greatest king of Babylon, um, and by the way, Nebuchadnezzar was a real king. You can go to the British Museum today, you can go to the, um, the uh, Pergamon Museum in East Berlin, or the eastern section of Berlin, and you will find relics and uh, descriptions of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, we have so much evidence today that Nebuchadnezzar lived, and it's interesting that the Bible in the book of Daniel centres the first part of it around the kingship of King Nebuchadnezzar. By the way, Nebuchadnezzar built one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. What was it? The yes, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. We've all heard about those. Well, he built them, and he built them for his wife, because his wife was a media from media from the media Persia or from media, and um, she was used to the living in the hill country the cooler climate. She came down to live in Babylon, which is a very, very hot place. And so he built her the gardens to uh, remind her of her home. Whether he pleased his wife, I don't know, but he certainly built one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. All right? So um, and we'll make reference to that as we go through. So the, the uh, whole book of Daniel is around conflict. And as we notice, it's going to start with Nebuchadnezzar going down into Jerusalem and taking God's people captive over to Babylon. And that's the background of Daniel. Daniel was one of the uh, students, young men, that Nebuchadnezzar took as a captive over to Babylon. So that's the central theme, not only of Daniel, but also of the whole scripture. It's interesting, you know, that every blockbuster film that's ever been made, like uh, Star Wars, um, what are some others? <coughs> Probably, yes. Um, Marvel Lord of the Rings. Yes, that's, that's a good one. What else? Marvel movies. Okay. No, I don't, I'm not familiar with any of these, but um, I know the theme. The theme of every blockbuster film that's ever been made is the great controversy thing. That is, things start well, a villain comes along, mucks it all up, a hero emerges and uh, defeats the enemy. And finally, they live happily ever after. Now, if you, uh, in a summary, that's what every blockbuster film that's ever been written and filmed is about. And it's interesting that that, that um, idea is not made up by the film director, it comes from the Bible. Mm -hmm. Because every one of us wants to read a story or watch a film that has the, the right, finally, being stronger than the wrong. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. it, it, that is, that right overcomes evil. Every happy story, you wouldn't want to read a book that's the other way around in which the villain knocks out the, uh, the hero. No, it's always the hero that finally wins. He may have a long tussle, but finally he wins over the, um, the enemy. Now, the reason that that's in our blood, that's in our DNA, is simply because God made it that way. And uh, that's why they make films like this. And it's interesting that this is the whole story of the Bible. It starts perfect, a villain comes along, mucks it up, a hero emerges, and Jesus, and then finally we live happily ever after. Get the idea? That's what the Bible's about to summarise it in just a few sentences. Uh, and uh, so we're going to notice that this is over and over again the theme, the arching theme in the book of Daniel. So the central theme of Daniel is the same cosmic conflict between the God of heaven and the powers of evil. And we're going to notice now how that outworks 
in uh, the first chapter of Daniel and we will continually refer to this as we go through Daniel because every chapter has this as its theme. And uh, this is what makes the book so, uh, so wonderful. All right, repeatedly conflict arises in the book of Daniel over the issues of worship and obedience. Once again, we're going to notice over and over again that the theme in Daniel is over worship and obedience. They're the two things. And um, we're going to notice the one of obedience this afternoon. In future, we will be majoring on the one on worship. But today, it's over obedience. Remember that the issues confronted in the stories of Daniel, now this is a very important point, the issues in the stories of Daniel. Now, what are the stories of Daniel? You've got um, Daniel. You've got uh, Meshach, Abednego, and um, in the in the fiery furnace. Remember, Daniel in the lion's den. Everyone knows about those stories. So they're the stories of Daniel. What we're saying here that the issues confronted in the stories of Daniel are the same issues in the prophecies of Daniel. So the stories of Daniel are not just there haphazardly, they have been put in there to illustrate the prophecies. Get the idea? And uh, you're going to notice that as we go through that relate to the time of the end. And so a very important part here is the fact that Daniel, we're going to notice, relates to the time of the end. Now, the time of the end is not the end of time. The end of time is when Jesus comes back. But the time of the end is a little period of time just before Jesus returns. That Daniel calls the time of the end. And the prophecies of Daniel all relate in their, in their major emphasis to the time of the end. So if you can remember that the stories of Daniel are not just there as pretty stories, there's a deeper meaning with those stories and they help us to understand the prophecies of the book of Daniel. The two things are related together. So the book is a perfect harmony together and we're going to notice that as we go through week by week. All right? Name the specific instances in the book of Daniel where the issues of worship and obedience illustrate the great controversy thing between Christ and Satan. All right, well, you haven't studied it yet, but I'm going to put the answers up here. And uh, you can turn to the, your lesson now and question one, and you can put the answers in. The first one is Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8, which says what Daniel eats. So we're going to study this in a moment. What Daniel eats is a matter of obedience, because he's going to be offered some food that is contrary to what the Bible says. So the first issue is over obedience and what Daniel is. The second is Daniel 3, which talks about the gold image. And a person had to bow down. This is over worship. Because the person had to bow down and worship that golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And we'll have a look at that in two time. Point C, Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar's insanity. Because Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar became insane for a period of seven years. Because he had just announced it's not this great Babylon that I have built. And believe me, he had built an amazing city. There's no question about that. Probably the greatest city that's ever pressed this earth was Babylon. And then point D, Daniel, in Daniel chapter 5, Belshazzar, the filing of the Lord's vessels, was over worship again. And in Daniel 6 and verse 11, Daniel's praying, because remember, the decree had gone for, don't pray to any other god except the king. And uh, so, they're the issues between worship and obedience, and we're going to cover all of this in the coming weeks. I'm just outlining so you know where we're going. And uh, so you can just write those questions in. 
this is what we want you to do at home. And uh, you haven't done it today, obviously, but for next week and the weeks after, you'll be able to go through it yourself and just write the answers in. So Daniel 1 is over worship and obedience. The issue concerning the king's food and wine. This is what we're going to read now of the story because, you see, back in those days, the king would take the brightest and the best young (coughs) men and women and take them over to his country to re-educate them. We all often refer to it as brainwashing. So to re-educate them, and then often they would allow them to go back into their city, back into their nation, with a bias toward, in this case, Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. Get the idea? So that they would not be a problem to the king Nebuchadnezzar now, because they had been re-educated, or brainwashed, into thinking the same way that the Babylonians thought. Now, our nations do the same thing today. Exactly the same. Um, and uh, so um, the issue is concerning the golden image, worship and obedience. And then Daniel chapter 4, we notice worship and obedience, the issue concerning Nebuchadnezzar's insanity. And we'll deal with that a little bit later when we get to Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 5, worship and obedience again, the issue concerning the writing on the wall. And we will study that when we get to Daniel 5. And then Daniel chapter 6 is over worship and obedience. The issue concerning Daniel's worship. Because that's why he was thrown into the lion's den. And once again, we'll cover that uh, soon when we get up to chapter 6. The issues are clear in the book of Daniel. Governments may try to impose laws that demand false worship or inhibit true worship, but only those that remain faithful and obedient to God are delivered. And that theme will be over and over and over again as we go through the book of Daniel. Alright? Question two. How do the prophecies of Daniel foretell the issue of worship and obedience? In the seventh chapter of Daniel it says this, he shall speak great words against the Most High. Who would the Most High be? That's God. So this power that it's talking about, it's a he, he's going to speak great words against God and B, shall intend to change times and laws. So you can see that here the opposing power in Daniel, the seventh chapter in the prophecy, outlines a power that's going to challenge God's law because he's going to make a law which is contrary to the law that God has made. Get the idea? So there is the conflict over obedience and the law of God. And uh, we'll get to that when we get to chapter 7. Once again, we're just getting an outline at the moment of the book of Daniel. The little horn power of Daniel 7, that's this opposing power, opposes true worship and faithful obedience to God's law. That's, That's his aim. And the devil is using this power to bring forth his own agenda, his opposition to God's law. And that's why the prophecy of Daniel chapter 7 is so important for us to understand. And we will get to that uh, soon. What did Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, do to Jerusalem, the city of God, according to Daniel 1.1? He received it completely overthrew it. And uh, in fact he had three goes at it and each time he uh, sacked part of the city but finally completely besieged it. Um, in Daniel 1.1. 1, 1. The conflict begins in Daniel with he and his friends taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar in 605 BC. So um, um, this was the uh, first conflict. And then it says, Who allowed Nebuchadnezzar to capture Jerusalem? Daniel 1 2, it says, The God of heaven did. Now you say, Well, that's a bit strange, isn't it? No, it's not, because the people, Daniel's people, the Jews, were being very disobedient to God. And so God allowed 
the Babylonians to come down to uh, take them captive so that they would learn some lessons in life. Get the idea? Jeremiah Longley. Yes, well, ju they're just uh, like our children sometimes. They've got to be punished because they do things that are wrong. And so God does the same. And he allowed the Babylonians to come down. While Nebuchadnezzar thinks he has conquered the Jews and their God, nonetheless, God is still in control. And that's a wonderful thing for us to realise too, that we don't just judge things by what's happening now, that God's still got his hand in control. And that's true of our lives. Sometimes in our own personal lives, things go wrong. Things aren't always what we would choose ourselves to have. But if we love the Lord, the Lord is still in control and he will work those things that are not necessarily good to our good. Get the idea? Because there are many things in life that happen to us that are not good. The text doesn't say that everything is good, but what the text says is that God will work things together for our good. Because some of the things that happen to us are positively bad. And uh, this was bad, but God is still in control. Why did God allow Judah to be taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, according to Jeremiah chapter 2, which is what you're alluding to? Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and given themselves broken systems that can hold no water. So Jeremiah is pointing out very clearly here that um, God allows punishment to come when we are disobedient. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and human for themselves broken systems. And you can imagine how useless a broken system is to, um, to keep water in. And God is using that as an illustration. of um, Because they have actually changed its God. And uh, we'll see that more and more as we go through. Thus says the Lord, What injustice have your fathers found in me, that they have gone far from me, have followed idols, and have become idolaters. Jeremiah 2 5. So there is a very clear statement where um, God is pointing out that they have been disobedient. Alright? Thus says the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem, nor carry a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hallow the Sabbath day, as I commanded your father. And we've studied the Sabbath. God was very, very <coughs> particular how the people kept the Sabbath. But they did not obey nor incline their ear, but made their neck stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. The Bible often talks about being stiff necked. That means being rebellious and not listening to what God says. And there's a statement in Jeremiah. But if you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. So God said, you disobey the, the Sabbath, then I will allow tragedy to come to you. And sometimes that's the only way we ever learn is when tragedy comes to us. Um, you know, sometimes the only way a person will look up is when God has to put them on their bed. And when they lie on their bed, the only direction they can look is up. And sometimes God has to allow that to happen in order for us to recognise that there is a God of heaven and um, that we're not the masters of our own destiny. And that's what this text is uh, saying. The Jews were taken captive to Babylon because of false worship and disobedience to God's commandments. Do you know how long they had been disobeying God? 490 years. And it's interesting that they went into captivity for how long? 70 years. Which is a Sabbath of 490, isn't that right? 7 into 490. They went into, because the land had not kept its Sabbath all of those years, God said, all right, they'll keep it all together now. And that's why they had 70 years captivity, based on that. Um, and so it was their disobedience. All right? 
Who seems to be winning the conflict as the book of Daniel opens? Who seems to be on the winning side in chapter 1? The gods of Babylon. Yeah, not, not the true God. It seems that uh, the gods of Babylon are in control. Yeah, that's the way it starts off. An important lesson. Evil may appear to prosper for a time, but in the end, God's truth will triumph gloriously. And uh, it seems, sometimes people say to me, why is it that the wicked seem to prosper and the righteous don't prosper? You may have wondered that yourself. Why do the wicked prosper? Well, remember this. They may seem to prosper for a while, but eventually they'll be brought down. And uh, God will, will see to that. A very good illustration of that at the moment, that's in the news, is this billionaire in America who's been um, raping girls for years and got away with it because of his money. But finally, he's caught up with it. And um, he's in prison and will go to prison for a long time, I think. Um, but there's an illustration. You could say to yourself, if you knew what was going on, and, and some people did know what was going on, um, and he was protected, that uh, you'd say, well, there's no justice in that. Well, eventually, God has his hand and justice comes about. What kind of people did Nebuchadnezzar choose from among the captives of Judea to be educated in the schools of Babylon? What kind of people? Of the king's descendants. So Daniel, we're going to find, was of a royal lineage. You get the idea? He, he was of the king's family. Young men in whom there was no blemish, blemish which means that uh, they were... Uh, Probably very good looking guys. We would use the word probably handsome. And um, well intellectual and uh, some of the top, the top men, young men in the kingdom. And obviously, if you were the king, Bet Nebuchadnezzar, you'd want the best. So, that's why Daniel was grabbed and his uh, friend. What kind of people did Nebuchadnezzar choose from among the captives of Judea to educate in the schools of Babylon? This is point C. Good looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge. So the Bible says they were good looking. Quick to understand. In other words, they had a good intellect. So there, he's got those answers in. And uh, question eight. If, any, if I'm going too fast if, and you want to go back, just so. I don't want to go too slow, but I don't want to go too fast either. How long was the educational process to last, uh, according to Daniel? How long? Does anyone know? Yeah, three years. So the brainwashing was going to be over a period of three years. And... Um, Right? Out of all the children of Judah who entered into the schooling, who are the only four youths named in the biblical record? Now this is something interesting because Daniel and his friends were not the only ones that were taken captive, but they're the only ones that are recognised. And maybe for very good reason that uh, the others didn't prove to be faithful to God and so their names are not recorded. But who are the names? Daniel? Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Now they're the uh, Hebrew names. Generally speaking, we call Daniel by his Hebrew name, but we call the other three boys by their Babylonian name, which is interesting. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I don't know why that is, really, but um, that's the way we do it. So they were their Hebrew names. Get the idea? You got those, the spelling right on that? <coughs> No, three. Right, as a right. Four. As I said, they're the only four we know. There were many others. But they were the ones who were faithful to God. 
making sense now? All right, then we're ready to go on. Daniel, that's interesting, when the Hebrews named their children, they just didn't look up the latest popular names to, to name their children. The names were, were usually prophetic of what they wanted their children to become. Get the idea? So a parent would name their child in accordance to what they aspired that child to be. And so Daniel's name means God, the E-L on the end of the word, means God. God is my judge. Which is interesting as we get into the prophecies of Daniel, we're going to notice that it deals with the judgment. And Daniel's name means God is my judge. Um, Hananiah, Jehovah is gracious. Michel, who belongs to God or is like God. And Azariah, Jehovah is my help. Their names were linked with the Hebrew names for God, Elohim and Jehovah or Yahweh. So they were the, that's how Hebrews named their children. As I said, it's very different to us today, and, but we need to understand that to know that the names were not just names that their parents had picked out of uh, the latest hundred best names or something. Um, all right, question 10. What Babylonian names were given to these four youths? First of all, there they are. Daniel was given Belteshazzar. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. So you can write those in with their spelling. I'll just allow you at a time to copy their names down. But you'll get into this when you start to read Daniel. Oh, I see. You want, you want to go back? Write in shorthand. Yeah. When you finish, when you've got it, just put your hand up so I know to move on. I don't want to... Yes, it's, it's interesting that... Um, to understand some of this background helps us to understand the prophecies and the prophetic aspect of Daniel um, and why it's such a wonderful book. And we get, we'll notice very soon that Jesus told us to study the book of Daniel. He said that in Matthew 24. Study and understand it. And uh, the vast majority of Christians hardly ever read it, let alone understand it. Um, so, are we right now to move on? Good. Um, there's the name, and you can write those in. So, um, yeah, there it is. Good. We move. <laughs> You've got a Slavic um, arm that's too slow. That's all right. Good. But anyway, if you read chapter one, you'll get these names. Yeah. Okay. I have got Daniel chapter one verse six for the name. Yes. But in the lesson chapter two, given Daniel one seven. Is it? Is that a mistake? Okay. Possible. Which is right, seven or six? Six. Probably, probably, probably that's the mistake, isn't it? The screen? It should be seven. Let me just check myself. Thank you for pointing that out. I, I hadn't picked that up. The, 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 yeah, it, yeah the, the lesson is correct. Verse seven. We'll need to change that. Um, we might be able to change that this afternoon. Later. All right. Belshazzar. Now, once again, the Babylonians named their children to honour their gods. So, Belshazzar means Bel protects the king. Shadrach, Shudar, Aku, commanded by Aku, the moon god. Right? 
and Meshach comes, who is like Aku, and Abednego, servant of the god Nabu or Nergo. So you can imagine how that would affect a Hebrew being named to honour the Babylonian god. Um, so um, you can uh, write that in if you uh, would like to. You've hardly got much space to do that, have you? But this was part of the Babylonianizing of the people, of the, of the students. Are we ready to move? All right. Who was to be the, what was to be the diet for those who were selected for this special in education? Daniel 1 verse 5. Because Nebuchadnezzar wanted to give them food that would um, once again Babylonianize them. So he offered them the king's delicate drink. So this was a great privilege for these young fellows to actually eat at the king's table and drink the same wine that he drank and eat the same food that he ate. You can imagine how honoured they were, so to speak, to be offered this. And, um, all right. Although given the privilege to eat and drink from the king's table, to do so would have meant disobedience to dietary and health laws God gave to Israel. So can you see the conflict right here at the beginning? The king is looking after them. He, uh, he likes these boys. He's, they've made a big impression on him. So he invites them in to eat at his food. And therefore they are in conflict immediately because they want to please the king because their head will come off if they don't. On the other hand, they want to please God too. So here we have the conflict starting right from the word go. These are in a very, very difficult situation. What had God told the Israelites about drinking wine? Proverbs 21 says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. So God had given some very strong instruction, instruction about drinking wine, and here Nebuchadnezzar was offering them wine. And... Um, Wine is always, alcohol <coughs> wine that is, is condemned in the Bible all the way through. And, uh, all right, we'll move along. Wine gives false courage, and we've all seen this, I'm sure. Hard liquor leads to brawls. What fools men are to let it master them, making them reel drunkenly down the street. That's an interesting translation, isn't it? Of Proverbs 20, verse 1 which is uh, true. Today's living Bible, that is. All right. There is nothing good about alcohol, as we know. What God told the Israelites about drinking wine in Proverbs 20, verse 1 and 23, 31, do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. You've seen drinkers swirling it in the, in the glass. God says, do not look upon the wine when it's like that, when it swirls. All right, let's move on. In the end, it bites like a snake and poisons like a viper. Proverbs 23, 31. So, uh, pretty, I mean, the Bible is using pretty graphic illustrations here when it's talking about this curse. It's interesting in, in the... Um, the news, I'm not going to go through all of this, but it's interesting this first point, likes to drink or drinks too much, whether it is an indifferent attitude with the excess consumption of alcohol or our ignorance when it comes to the effect it has on our bodies, Australia's most socially accepted drug is indeed destroying life <coughs> today. And um, it says here that there are 15 deaths every day in Australia from alcohol, that's a 60% increase from a decade ago. In addition to this, 430 people are admitted to hospital for treatment for alcohol-related injuries or disease every day. The Australian medical profession is profoundly concerned that the harms of alcohol are getting worse. Domestic violence, depression, deaths from trauma, obesity, the list goes on. Yes, all right, well, we probably all know the effects of this. 
Question 13. What foods had God forbidden the Israelites to eat that might well have been on King Nebuchadnezzar's table? Leviticus 11, 2 to 8 tells us the unclean animals. And uh, if you want to read Leviticus 11 sometime, you've got the reference there so you can read it. And that, if you studied this, if I've given it to you last week and you'd read it, you could have read what that chapter says and you can still do it when you go home and, and have a look this week on Leviticus 11, the unclean animals. Um, mm-hmm. It says here that you know, pork may well have been on the king's table. It probably was. And uh, so that's one of the things God says for us not to eat. And when faced with disobedience to God's law, Daniel and his friends did not hesitate in making a decision. So now you can see the conflict. They've said no to the king's food because they knew what was right. So now they're in deep trouble. And we're going to see how the story now unwinds with what happens. What decision did Daniel and his friends make? That Daniel purposed. I like that word purpose. What does the word purpose mean? If you purposed. Yes. Yeah, I made, he made a decision. A determined decision. Purposed in his heart that he would not define himself with a portion of the king's delicacy, nor with the wine which he drank. So Daniel and his friends made a decision that they would not eat this food. Now, big problems now. Notice what happens next. Some food is pronounced unclean according to the biblical health law. To eat the king's food would have meant disobedience to God's real will. The food would have previously been sacrificed to the Babylonian gods in an act of worship to those gods. Hence, to eat the king's food would have been seen as an acknowledgement of those gods. So that was the conflict that Daniel had in his heart. I eat it, I'm acknowledging the Babylonian gods, and to eat it would be directly disobedient to what God has asked us to do. For Daniel, loyalty to God was more important than loyalty to the king. Like Daniel, God's end time people will not hesitate to choose obedience to God over obedience to man. So this is now where we're seeing why the book of Daniel is so relevant to us because it's not just dealing, we're not just dealing with a story that happened many, many years ago that has no relevance to us today, not at all. We're seeing a story that happened back there that is illustrative of what's going to happen to God's people in the last days. Get the idea? That's why Daniel is such an important uh, book, not just stories of a long ago. And most people in reading Daniel would only see the stories that happened a long time ago. What did Daniel ask of the prince of the eunuchs? Now, that he might not defile himself. Well, he says to the uh, fellow in charge, who was like the, the cook or the person in charge of all the food, and the, the young men and women, that uh, he, his job was to make sure they were looked after. And so Daniel appeals to him and says, look, could I not eat this food because it will defile me? Now what does he say? How did the prince of the eunuchs view Daniel? Daniel 1.9, with favour and goodwill. Now obviously he had made a big impression on the eunuch here, the leader who was there. By the way, the king's court was full of eunuchs. Why? Why would he have made them eunuchs? They can't get out the tricks of his wives. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> they can't get much. It was to protect the king's wives from, from them. Because remember, he would have had the prettiest and the most beautiful women that were available in the kingdom would be the king. And... Uh, so that was to make sure that they were protected. Um, my son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. And so find favour and high esteem in the sight of God and man. So God is saying here, if you're obedient to me, I will make sure that you not only have favour with me, but also favour with your fellow human beings. 
So when we're obedient and put God first, then God makes sure that we will have favour with both God and man. And that's the promise. Proverbs 3, 1 to 4. How did the prince of the eunuchs respond to Daniel's request? I fear my lord, the king. Why would he fear the, the king? Why do you think he would fear the king? Yeah, because if he didn't eat the food, that is, if Daniel didn't eat the food and he started to get thin and pale looking, who do you think would cut the responsibility and lose his head? The eunuch. So he was not so worried for Daniel, he was worried for his own head. I fear if I let you get away with this, what might happen to you? Should Daniel and his friends help deteriorate from not eating the king's table, the chief of eunuchs would be held responsible and probably be killed. Hence he was afraid of what might happen. Yeah. What test did Daniel suggest? It's a very interesting test. Yes, a ten day test. In other words, he said to the eunuch, just give us ten days and I'll prove to you that uh, I'll be healthier than everybody else. Just in ten days. And uh, all right, so let's see what happens. Please test your servants for ten days. That's the words that Daniel gives. Daniel 1 12. What did Daniel and his friends request to eat during the ten day test? Give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. It's a pretty simple diet, isn't it? In other words, we would say today that Daniel's diet was plant based, isn't that right? And he didn't drink even fruit juice, he drank water. And isn't it interesting today that medical science tells us that this is the very best diet? After all these years, we have found that this is the best diet. And uh, we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because we've been over this. But Daniel chose a plant-based diet and water only to drink. Who would be healthier after 10 days? Well, that was the test. At the end of 10 days, who appeared in better health? Daniel and his friends. By a long way. The others were pale. He was a ruddy complexion. Healthy. Smart. With his mind, because when you're on this, this diet, your mind becomes sharper. And... Uh, for Daniel and his friends, health was vitally important to maintain a clear mind to resist temptation and maintain loyalty to God should even bigger tests come. This is why God is so concerned about our health. It's not just because God wants to take away some food that we might like. It's because if you have this diet, it enables you in your relationship to God to build that relationship in a much more meaningful way. See the idea? Because the other food is against that. And Daniel's request for a plant-based diet is today considered the best in the world. Our modern world's just catching up with what God led Daniel to eat over two and a half thousand years ago. In fact, um, some of you may... Um, this is just very interesting. I mean, it's a few years old now. But it's interesting when they were talking about the 2016 presidential election, you know, which Trump was uh, elected. Um, it says veganism can't run for president but let's at least bring it into the debate at the helm of political debates and divisive party lines new research shows a plant based vegan diet can reduce 70% of food based emissions slash up to 1 trillion dollars in annual health care spending and save 8.1 million lives over 30 years can you see why this became a political issue see and um, outside of strengthening national security by combating chronic disease like childhood obesity and 
uh, pre-diabetes, a plant-based prescription can free up scientists' valuable time and research money to focus on larger initiatives such as precision medicine and preventing the spread of infectious disease. So, in most of our hospitals are full of, full of people who are um, diseased because of their diet and their lifestyle. If we're to, what they're saying here, if we're to correct people's lifestyle, then the money that would be saved in doing that can be used in more productive areas of uh, health. And so that was the political side of it. I'm just putting that up as a, as a point of interest, not as anything else. Um, this book is probably well known to some of you. Uh, not written by a Seventh-day Adventist, but uh, the findings, people who ate the most animal-based foods got the most chronic disease. People who ate the most plant-based foods were the healthiest and tended to avoid chronic disease. These results could not be ignored. That's what he says on page seven. That's not an Advent. And uh, I sometimes wonder, you know, if, if a person is disobedient to what God has asked us to do and then finally gets cancer, then wants to pray to God that God will heal them. I think that's pretty audacious of us to do that. When God has given us the instruction, we get sick because we don't, we're not obedient, and then we want to pray to God to heal us. On the first page. Yes, well then it says here, and next again, he says, these findings show that heart disease, diabetes and obesity can be reversed by a healthy diet. <coughs> All of these diseases can be reversed. Other research shows that various cancers, autoimmune diseases, bone health, kidney health, vision and brain disorders in old age like cognitive dysfunction and Alzheimer's are convincingly influenced by diet. So if you could go back and check those who help have Alzheimer's and so forth, you'll probably find that their diet was anything but good. Related to diet. That's what they're saying in, in the latest study, and this is uh, most importantly the diet that has time and again been shown to reverse and or prevent these diseases is the same whole food plant-based diet. I mean, what more evidence could God give us of uh, this than he has? All right, we'll talk more about that later on. Because of Daniel's faithfulness, what did God give him? God gave them knowledge, skill in all literature and wisdom and Daniel had understanding in all dreams and visions. These were the results of um, Daniel's obedience. And I would like to have more knowledge and skill, wouldn't you? Yes. So um, that's the way to do it, is to get onto this uh, plant-based diet. Because of their strict obedience to his principles, God gave them special wisdom and knowledge. When Daniel received the prophetic gift, God always honours loving obedience. And that's a very important point. God always honours loving obedience. All right. When they took their final examination, how much better did Daniel and his friends do than everyone else? Ten times better. Pretty significant, isn't it? I don't think that God just made that, that uh, statement up. Ten times better. Loyal and obedient in Daniel chapter 1. That's what the story's about. And um, loyal and obedient in Daniel chapter 3. And we're going to get to that very soon. This is the theme of each of these chapters. Loyal and obedient chapter 1. Loyal and obedient in chapter 3. Loyal and obedient in chapter 6. The same theme, recurring theme, occurs over and over again. And here's a question that I'd like you to answer, I hope in the affirmative. Do you wish to be loyal and obedient to God in a time of prosperity? That you too might be loyal and true to God when times of difficulty come. What would you like to say then? Yes. I certainly want to say yes to that. All right, now we've taken a little longer today because we had to go through, but this is why I would like you, if you would, to do your, your homework so that when you come next week, 
you will be ready for, and you've got a wonderful prophecy next week. So, all right, now I'm gonna, we're going to have a little quiz. Um, this is to test how good I have been in teaching you, all right? Have you got those envelopes? May, could I have an envelope, please? An envelope, please. Oh, here, here they are. Sorry, thank you. Uh, you've all got one of these. And this has... Um, yes, there's more. Anyone need an envelope? Just put your hand up. Yes, there's more at the back. Um, Jason? Anyone else? When you come in each week, always make sure you get your envelope. All right, now, anyone without a pen or pencil or something to write with? Because you'll need something to write with. If you've got your own, that's fine, but if you haven't, we've got one here for you. All right. Now, as I said, this quiz is not so much to test you as it is to test me. Whether I need to improve in my teaching ability. All right? Here's the first question. The two issues over which controversy arises in the book of Daniel are the issues of worship and obedience. Is that true or false? No, call it out. You put the answer on your envelope. You are in number one there, see it? Under the quiz, number one, you put down true or false. Yes. There's the question. The two issues over which controversy arises in the book of Daniel are the issues of worship and obedience. Is that statement true or is it false? You then put the answer on your envelope. <laughs> True or false, is that right? Okay. Good. Okay, alright. Number two. All the children of Israel refused to eat the king's food and drink his wine. Now notice, the key is the word all of the children of Israel refused to eat the king's food and drink his wine. Is that true or false? And once again, put the answer under number two. You put true or false. I hope your answer to number two is different to one, the answer to number one. <laughs> All right? Okay. Number three. The reason Daniel would not eat the king's food and drink his wine was that he thought he was better than everybody else. Is that true or false? And uh, you put the answer down there under three. He thought he was better than everyone else. <coughs> number four, as a result of their loyalty to God, Daniel and his friends did ten times better than anyone else in the University of Babylon. True, True or false? True. You put it down. Number four. And then... Number five, the only ones who passed the severe test in the book of Daniel were those who passed the small test in chapter one. The only ones who passed the severe test in the latter chapters of Daniel were the ones who passed the smaller test in the very first chapter of Daniel. Because they're related. If you're faithful in the little things, you'll be faithful in the big. If you're not faithful in the little, you're certainly not going to be faithful in the big. And that's what this question is really underlying. All right? So you've got all those answers? All right. Now let's, you check your answers. You agree with that? True? All the children of Israel refused to eat the king's food and drink his wine. False. False. The reason Daniel would not eat the king's food and drink was that he thought he was better than everyone else. False. False. 
as a result of their loyalty to God, Daniel and his friends did eat ten times, did ten times better than anyone else in the university. <laughs> True. Yeah. The only ones who passed the severe test in the book of Daniel were those who passed the small test in chapter one, and you got. Good. Yeah. Did you get a hundred percent? That encourages me. Very good. Now, there's something else that I uh, want you to have a look at. That um, you see on the left-hand side, one, two, three. There, little box. I'm going to to read you two statements and I'd like you to um, if you agree with these statements to tick first of all box one this is the, the question is it your desire to be loyal to God in times of prosperity that he may also be loyal to God in times of adversity in other words is it your desire that I want to be faithful in the little things so that when the big issues come along, I'll be faithful in those? If, you, uh, if that's your prayer, tick the little box, number one, would you? Just, just tick it, that's all you've got to do. Number two, if you would like us to pray for you, because we all have issues in our lives, and if you'd like us to pray for you, just tick box number two, would you? And we will do that, because... Um, that's important. Now, I'll tell you why the quiz is important for you to do, because we will add these up, and for those of us who get a pretty high score each week, then we'll have something special to give you toward the end. How's that? Alright? That's a bit of what we call an incentive. Alright? So, now, there's one other purpose for this envelope. Obviously, to provide the Bible and the lessons and so forth, there is a cost involved. If you want to help us from week to week, you may not have anything today, that's fine. But if you want to, you can just put it in this envelope as well. Is that the idea? So that's the purpose of the envelope. Three things. Each week we will do a quiz. Each week we will uh, have a response, a personal response, because we need to do that as individuals. And thirdly, if you want to help, then you can do that. Is that right? All right, any questions? Pardon? There's no number three this time. Sometimes there will be, but sometimes there won't be. And today is one that won't be. Um, Jason, could you ask uh, May if she wouldn't mind giving lesson number four out now, please? We'll give a lesson to everyone. This is next week's lesson. All right, we're going to give you now that you put in your folder and this is what we would like you to study uh, for next week. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you this afternoon for your love. I thank you for the story of Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, those three faithful boys. And I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be faithful. Help us to be faithful in the little things so when the big tests come that we'll be faithful then too. So bless us now and bring us back again next week, I pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.